Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the Women Business Collaborative CEO Monthly Roundtable. WBC has an unwavering mission of equal position pay and power for all business women. And we're the only collaborative that is a movement with 44 major women's business organizations and hundreds in our advisory and leaders. We are there to change the numbers with the type of champions who are on this call today. So just a quick note, because you know WBC's nine action items, when we go back and look at women CEOs, fortune numbers have gone to 8.4%. And that we're tracking the fortune, the Russell, the S&P, but we'll be putting out a release in Women's History Month. The executive suite is really changing, particularly with women of color. And on our board and area, and we're working with 11 board organizations, but we work with Equilar to track the data on public boards. So look back to January last year. On 2020, we were about 20% women joining boards. On October, November, December, and January, we hit an average of 40% women joining public boards and a third of those are women of color. We are about change. When we look at boards, it's not only the public boards and the private boards, but the SPACs and capital boards, we're seeing change. It is our joy as we end Black History Month and we salute Women's History Month Starting Monday, WBC has at least eight formal events during Women's History Month, and we want to hear from all of you. There's nothing more important than CEO leadership. So it is our joy to, one, introduce Robert Reese, the president and CEO of the CEO Forum, and Becky Schambau of Schambau Leadership, and salute a third person, Jose Zalestra, who most of you know has been on this committee and we love you dearly. With that, it is to say, have a productive, substantive, compelling round table and back to Becky and Robert. Thank you so much. Thank you, Edie. And thank you for your outstanding vision for WBC and all you've done to gravitize all of the energy around this great movement of WBC. It's great to have you all. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Robert, great to have a, a chance to partner with you again as well. So I'm Becky Shambaugh, uh, president and founder of CEO and founder of Women in Leadership and Learning. Um, today, we're going to engage uh, in a very special CEO forum uh, with three successful CEOs. Um, but I think one of the unique sort of aspects of this roundtable is something that I think is very important is that we invited three men who not only run successful organizations, which we'll learn more about, but also have something in common. And that is that they are the real ch deal for championing diversity, equity, and inclusion. And they have stories to really talk about. Uh, and outcomes that they can share and celebrate today with all of us uh, on this uh, session today. So what I'd like to do is to briefly introduce um, all the, both of all the three CEOs and then we'll get into the interviews. Um, number one is I'd like to welcome Che Huang. He is the CEO of Boxed, one of the largest wholesale organizations in the company. It was founded back in 2013 by an experienced group of tech pioneers right, and have made this just a successful and scalable organization. So welcome, welcome Chai, nice to have you here. Thanks for having um, me. Great, and then we have Brian Garish. Brian is the president of Banfield Pet Hospitals. 
Banfield is some, has a notable record. It's the largest in the world of pet veterinary practices. Uh, it was founded in, in 2007, has joined the, with Mars Corporation uh, as a family business, and today has more than 1,000 a 1, hospitals across the United States and in Puerto Rico. And then our other third CEO is Brandon Barnholt. He's the president and CEO of CAHI who, Distributors, which is one of the largest food distributors in the country uh, that has a specialty around organic foods, which actually during the COVID experience, all of us are shopping and probably using a lot of the distribution services that, that Brandon has been offering us. Um, and so we're gonna to talk to all of these CEOs about their businesses, but how they've been able to champion and harness gender equity within their organizations, uh, create more of that inclusive culture, but also have an impact in the marketplace as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague to kick off the interviews. Robert, would you like to ask the first question? Absolutely, thanks Becky, and always fun to be working together. So Jay, I wanna start off with you. So it was fairly recent in 2013 when you were one of the founders of Boxed, which has obviously had dramatic growth, but there's track records of significant success of all of the founders and people involved. So what, when you started, what was really the purpose behind Box and how it serves the broader communities. Sure, you know, um, yeah, when it, um, you know, when you first start any business, uh, um, you're really thinking about yourself, frankly, you know, um, and not a lot of entrepreneurs will, 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 will admit that, that when you start a business, um, uh, um, you just wanna work for yourself, uh, be your own boss and hopefully be able to make something successful where it'll be professionally and financially kind of, um, uh, uh, a great outcome for, for you when you first start. Um, but over time, that mission has, has changed uh, and it very much goes from being about yourself to all those around you, uh, including the folks that are in the fulfillment centers and including those folks in our W2 corporate environment. So when we think about why we started uh, from a consumer perspective though, um, it was very much to serve folks who didn't have the time, the means or the patience to get to a warehouse club. Uh, so you take a name like Costco, for example, great company, um, ubiquitous in name, but not ubiquitous in location. So there are folks that don't live within a 60 to 90 minute drive of a Costco. And those folks right now are pretty heavily underserved when it comes to the wholesale uh, market. And so um, that is who we aim to serve. And today, most folks um, uh, probably think that we're, we're mainly coastal in our customer set, but that, could be, uh, that couldn't be further from the truth. So started off in a garage, uh, perhaps serving the coast, uh, but now that's come uh, so, so far from, from those first days. Great, Che. Well, definitely, you, you know, a great entrepreneur, and congratulations on how you've been able to really. Grow here, in. But I want to, I want to hand it back to Becky. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think what we'd love to hear from you and everyone chiming in today is culture is so important, right? Culture matters. Uh, tell us about your principles of culture, and a how they support uh, an inclusive environment, and, and and you can even expand out into the external marketplace as well. Yeah, you know, um, what we try to do is, is really have uh, an environment where people can make change for themselves here as well as externally. Um, we've done that whether through it's the pink tax um, and kind of making sure that, you know, we continue to rebate uh, uh, kind of any tax, whether it's state and legislative or, or kind of manufacturer or, or industry driven tax that, you know, unfairly charge women a different price for a pink razor versus a blue razor or that you know, when we simply had to collect sales tax on uh, so, so-called luxury good items like feminine care products. And so um, that's kind of what we're, we've been doing. Um, but when it comes down to why we do such things, it goes back to the culture of being able to make change. Um, we have to draw kind of a line sometimes because a lot of folks uh, uh, kind of wonder, are we a charity or are we uh, a for-profit business? Uh, and so basically the culture and kind of the lines we've drawn here internally are that, um, is it a good, uh, and, and is it a good initiative that can uh, be very important for a large amount of folks out there? If the answer is yes, then we draw one circle. Um, does it have something to do with what we do as a core business? And if the answer is yes, then we draw that other circle. 
And the initiatives we undertake are really kind of the, the formulation of that Venn diagram. Uh, uh, if there is a significant overlap between those two circles, then that's what we do. So we sell tens of millions of dollars of feminine care products a, a year. Um, uh, we have to basic, you know, based on state law, collect sales tax unfairly, in our opinion, uh, on those on the feminine care products. Um, and so it's part of our core business. We can affect change. And that's why we, re we rebate that tax back to um, uh, the women that shop with Vox. Um, I will say that that kind of overall ethos um, has borne itself out into the overall environment here. So um, by attracting folks that are looking to make change within their society or within their corner of the world uh, or within here at Box, um, it has kind of attracted diversity of thought and also diversity of, of, of people here. So uh, one thing that we really never brandished uh, uh, publicly is that uh, over half of, of the uh, corporate staff at Box uh, identify as ethnic minorities. So we're actually majority minority here uh, at Box in the office environment. Um, I think the exact number is 56.3%. Uh, so um, uh, starting off with that Venn diagram and then kind of making it core to what we do um, has certainly kind of had some benefits in, in kind of uh, our, our overall diversity numbers and initiatives. So I'd love to just learn more about, Jay, that this pink tax, I mean, that was a significant impact that you've had and a great role model for other organizations to examine, you know, how their marketing equitable sort of uh, consumer programs are really working out there, right? And so how I would imagine, please comment on this, that given that you've created more of an equitable sort of consumer platform for women, right? Um, has that impacted how the business that they get that they're, that, are, that they're drawn to you on? Have they, has it accelerated their actually retention as a customer for all of you? Yeah, abso absolutely. And I think this is something that a lot of companies are missing these days is that doing the right thing uh, and, and doing good could actually become good for business. Uh, I think what you're seeing, especially for a younger generation and a younger shopper, uh, is that they're starting to vote uh, or shop with their wallet, uh, meaning that they're shopping with folks uh, that make them feel good or that align with their level of thinking outside of just providing products of high quality at a good price. Uh, and so what you actually find is that when we poll our customers, over 70% of whom are women, um, uh, actually what you find from them is that uh, a top three reason why they shop box uh, is our stance uh, uh, on the pink tax and other initiatives that we've taken. So, um, it, you know, it's doing good yet. Of course, when you look at the line of how much money we've had to rebate back, it's a really hefty line. Um, but when you think about the goodwill, as well as the repeat behavior, as well as the awareness we've driven with it, uh, it more than pays for itself. Well, that's real change, right? I, I, I guess the, the, the last question I'd like to ask you is that what, what are the top three or the top two leadership qualities to help really drive the change. Because, you know, Che, that we all know that there, there's a lot of conversation, right? Um, but we're beginning to see movement, as Edie said, but what are the, what, what guidance, you know, what practices or, uh, you know, coaching do you have for other CEOs, other executives here listening in to really move from conversation to action? Because you really have. Um, yeah, I, I think twofold. One is just being open-minded. It sounds so simple. Um, and even myself, I, I've had to train myself. So think about the pink tax. That certainly wasn't my idea. Um, the women of Box came together and said, you know, we sell tens of millions of dollars of tampons and pads and, and, and we we're, are charging women an unfair tax um, on this. Um, and coming to me as a CEO, uh, you know, sitting down in that first meeting uh, and hearing that, you know, the projected hit to our bottom line will be millions of dollars. Um, you know, if you don't have an open mind, certainly the meeting won't last very long. Um, and so, thinking about how it affects kind of our customer base uh, and thinking about maybe the overall benefits, not only to them, but also to us as a company, uh, really, I, frankly, I, I will have to admit, challenge even my open-mindedness. Um, because when you're stuck with the bill, it, when you want to do something right, that's one thing. And if the cost of that is $3.99, it's quite easy to do. But when someone's sticking you with a bill for millions of dollars that you have to then defend with the board and shareholders, uh, it becomes a harder, harder path. Uh, 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 and suddenly, um, you know, I even find myself uh, being challenged, I, I'd have to admit. So luckily, I think being open-minded is a core a leadership trait that, that we look for. I think, too, uh, uh, even as a shared experience that I'm still learning these days is that, um, you know, I've learned that diversity um, does not, you know, whether it's ethnic diversity, gender diversity, um, it actually does not equate to inclusion. Um, for so long, I felt like those lines were, were blurred in the sense that diversity is inclusion, but it's not. Um, and I've realized that the hard way. 
Uh, so it's something that we're even still trying to work on. So um, when you think about uh, having diverse set of leaders around the table and across the company, that is definitely a great thing for us to strive to. But just having them around the table um, is not the end all be all. If you're not including them uh, in the decisions, um, if it's not a welcoming place for them, uh, certainly you can be diverse without be, being inclusive. And we're learning that in real time right now. So uh, we're not done, uh, uh, even as a, a growing company who has made strides, uh, we still got a lot of work to do. That's so, so important, right? And, and I think it's just shared by so many other organizations. We may have rich diversity, but we're not tapping into it, right? And that's really the inclusive mindset behaviors and, and, and the understanding of the why for inclusion, right? So I think you spelled that out very clearly. Well, thank you for sharing. Great, great progress. And, and thank you for featuring some of your practices out there. Jay, Thanks. I'm going to turn it over to Robert now, um, and let's introduce Brandon uh, Barnholt, or excuse me, not Brandon, but Brian Garish. Brian, uh, welcome again. Uh, Robert, would you like to kick off and uh, interview uh, Brian for our first question? Well, Robert, you're muted, it looks like. Looks like Robert might yeah. be having some tech issues. So, well, listen, Brian, I think we can we can kick so, this off. So, Brian, it's it's a great organization. Can you hear me? It's a bit spotty. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Hello? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Okay. So, so um, you were explaining to me that pets are really the one key issue that has helped so many people get through the pandemic early. And it, it's like they are the ones who are saving us. Just walk through as the largest pet hospital in all of America, what it was like during the pandemic. Yeah, thanks. So it's, it's, it, we would rather not be in the middle of a pandemic. It's been, it's been tough for everyone. We've all experienced something that's been different in our lives. Personally, professionally, with our That's friends and family. He sent it to me. And and what's been what's been interesting is you know when the pandemic first happened, it was clear, and I'm proud of how our leaders responded. Our first response was to keep everyone, all of our associates, safe and working. Our first decision was not to figure out what's happening with the business, but to keep everyone safe, keep everyone working and making sure that we were taking care of everyone and informing is doing as much communication as possible, just so everyone understood what, what, what we know and we can keep that two-way dialogue alive. What we found very quickly was what we knew before the pandemic was the human animal bond was so incredibly strong. What we found during the pandemic was the bond was even stronger than we all expected. The need for companionship has never been more important. And I would like to try to put a spin on a tough year by saying 2020 was really the year of the pet, where the pet came into our lives and played an even more important part of our lives. And personally, my, my routine was completely changed. I'm not going to the office any longer and I'm staying at home and I have my two cats, Ashton and Kenji. And I always knew how important they were in my, lives, in my life, but I never knew how important they were until I spent so much time with them. And the, the love that they provide has been, has been incredible. And I'm so thankful for my two cats, Ashton and Kenji. I'm so thankful for all of our ni over 19,000 associates who truly are connected on a purpose to make a better world for pets. And I'm proud that our leaders really stepped up to say, how do we keep our people safe? Because we know that bond is strong and whatever we're going to experience, we may not know, but we know that every procedure we do at Banfield Pet Hospital is designed for the benefit of the pet and the pet population. And we have a responsibility to keep that human animal bond even stronger and make sure that we can provide you know, some silver lining in a very tough year. Thank you, Brian. Over to you, Becky. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to kind of build upon that. You, you know, Brian, we spoke earlier and you talked about the focus of the power of people, the sure. power of people together, right? It's that power of one coming together and really having an impact, uh, a, a positive impact for animals, for pets. And I think you've created some, you know, sort of assumptions around the culture, but also programs there to really 
help your employees feel engaged and a part of something bigger than themselves to really make a difference. And, and to me, that's one of the core spirits and definitions of inclusion. Share more with us about that, the creation of that and, and what uh, Banfield is doing to really empower people to make a difference, a positive difference for their communities, for the pets around the world or our country. Sure. Well, strategy without empathy is a wasted idea. And you can create the, but the greatest strategic direction, but if you don't have a culture that supports bringing people together to, uh, to achieve our, our purpose, then it doesn't matter. And it was very clear for me to put culture as our top priority. And our culture comes to life through our leaders, and it's about mo role modeling the behaviors and being clear on what's expected. And when I think about culture, it started off with our inclusion and diversity journey. We were very intentional to stop calling it you know, DNI and diversity inclusion to change that because it, it's something that Che even mentioned. I mean, inclusion is a choice. You choose to be inclusive. And when you can, when you can bring people into the conversation, it, it invites people to have the conversation, to understand, to, to ask questions. And, it, and we've seen the more of that with been happening in society around allyship. We now wanna move away from allyship. It's about activism. It's about action. Taking action is the most important thing, not talking about things any longer. It's about taking action. So when I think about bringing our culture and bringing our people together, it starts with our equity, inclusion, and diversity journey. It also starts with how do we create true psychological safety where people can have conversation. And in creating a psychological safe space is not easy. And it's not about hearing all the good news. It's about hearing and being part of very, very tough conversations. And the way we can do that is by showing up in very authentic ways to, to welcome that conversation, to make sure that we understand what people are experiencing and how we can be part of the solution for them. So it's really using empathy to the, to the highest degree possible. And finally, what I'll mention is it's about our health and well-being journey. We define health and well, health and well-being five ways: healthy body, healthy mind, healthy career, healthy community, and healthy finances. And we've been focused at Banfield on our strategic direction is really centered on what I refer to as the, the intersection of pet health and societal well-being. We are, I am very, very focused on societal well-being and understanding that as a business, we have the responsibility to, to model how a business ought to behave in society. And we focus on what are the big issues in society? Do those issues impact our industry? If so, it's that Venn diagram that Che talked about, bringing it together and saying, what's our responsibility to model the way for how a company ought to behave, to take care of our people? And that's led the creation of a student debt repayment program for our veterinarians who have the highest student debt of, to income of ratio of any healthcare profession. It's about understanding how domestic violence is playing a, is, is important, uh, I mean, it's an important topic. It's an issue in this country with over 10 million recorded cases of domestic violence. And 89% of, of abusers threaten to kill, harm, or maim a pet. Mm -hmm. And when someone finally has the courage to leave, they often go to a shelter. And less than 10% of shelters can actually take care or provide assistance for a pet. Therefore, 49% of abuse victims will go back to an abusive situation because they're scared for their pet safety. That's unacceptable. And we have a responsibility to, to do something about this and make, make change. And that's part of that health and well-being journey and that societal impact that we're focused in on. And, and that's how we want to activate our culture to make sure that we're just not talking about things, we're actually taking action and role modeling how a company ought to behave in society. Well, Brian, thank you for that. I mean, I think it's being purposeful about what you're doing, right? And it seems to just, you, you, you know, you, you just shine when you talk about this. We, we know it's an intrinsic purpose for you as a leader. So thank you for that. And, and I would sure. imagine, and just share this, the, the, the demographics of your talent within the organization, given that you, you are really, uh, have a strong principle around the intersection of people and community. Yes. Has that made a difference around, let, let, call it inclusion, call people feeling engaged, call mm -hmm. people feeling a part of and belonging. Has that made an impact? Oh, absolutely. Without question it has. We have the best retention in the history of our organization. And by focusing on our people, 
and, and that and culture, it is it has opened so many opportunities for our leaders to have better career opportunities. What I, what I, when I joined Banfield, I joined about five and a half years ago. I was amazed on how purpose-driven this industry, this industry is. And it, it, it just didn't make sense to me on what our turnover rates were. So, so, so many of our associates came to us because they have a love for pets, yet we were not able to retain the associates to the degree in which I thought was, was best in class. And it was, it was that curiosity of what's happening, why is it happening, and why are we not able to retain so many of our associates? And that focus on culture has led to not just, not just words on a, on a paper, but true action. This is what we believe, and this is how we will show up. And this is why I'm so proud of our leaders who really have modeled the behavior of listening at scale. I talk a lot about listening at scale. That's about creating the safe conditions to, to listen at all levels, inside and outside of our organization, understand what's working, what's not working, and how can we make sure that the strategic direction of our company is being decided by our associates or it's being validated by our associates. This is not a top-down approach. This is a, this is a, this is a, this is a humanity thing. And humanity is about listening and being the right leader for all the people that we have the opportunity to serve. You know, it, it's interesting, Brian, you know, we started, Robert and I started the, these roundtables back in March when, you know, COVID really hit. And a consistent theme in all these interviews is the empathetic leader, the empathetic culture, you know, really listening, which is hard, but listening with intention uh, right. and, and it demonstrates that really caring for people. And then, you know what, that translates into ideation, Absolutely. greater problem solving and critical thinking, right? But we've talked about that, but thank you for walking the talk and creating uh, that within your organization as, a, as an assumption in terms of how people really work and treat one another. So, yes. and, and yes. I just had another quick question for you sure. too, and that, uh, in terms of your talent pipeline with women, are there, are there a lot of women that, that come into your organization and what kind of jobs do they take and how do you attract and retain them? And, and uh, uh, any thoughts, any work that you've been doing there? Yes, well, we, 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 do a, we do a lot of work on, on, that, on that front. What I, what I think is more important is, is like really in our corporate office and in our, in our leadership, uh, in our field leadership roles. Why I say that, because the, the, the veterinary profession is, is strong um, in terms of the, the, when you look at the demographics, over 80% of, of graduating veterinarians are, are, are women right now. And so to me, it's less about how do we you know, find veterinarians, it's how do we role model careers and opportunities for all women across the organization? Because it's, e it's easy to have, say, women come in from the veterinary side, but how do we make sure veterinarians that want to pursue a career in business have opportunities on our, on our business side? How do we make sure from a corporate office we have the proper workforce representation? And one, one of those ways, I have a bias towards talent and I have a, I have a bias towards action. And I think when you are relentless in finding the best people and building that network, you'll find you'll find the best, and those become the best role models. So it's less about, from, from my standpoint, is what can our organization do? It's what can I do? When I look at my senior leadership team, you know, uh, there's eight, we have eight of us on the on the team. Five are female, three are male, and when I look at that, I'm I'm so excited to have our chief marketing officer who she can say, this is what, uh, this is, I can be not just a mentor, but a sponsor and, 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 and put the spotlight on, on, on women in, in executive C-suite roles. And so it's about me walking the talk, but it's about me also making sure that the shadow I'm casting is reflective of the, the, the environment and the world that I want. And, and, and when we have that, we now have a, a fantastic team that is built on absolute talent and we, yes, we do some mentor mentoring, but it's also about sponsorship. Sponsorship is so important for me because sponsorship is about the specific person or people you are representing and you are fighting for versus something that's very vague and saying, oh yeah, I mentor five people and we're not having the conversation. It's clear on these are the people that I'm at stake for. And that's really more important to me. And as we've been able to do that from an executive standpoint, team standpoint, we're very representative of our workforce. And additionally, then it, 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 it trickles all the way down our organization. And I'm proud of the balance that we have, whether it's gender or just diversity in general. Yeah, you know, we'll just, we'll close now, but I just, this sponsorship is so critical, right? And I think 
all of us who have ascended have grown have always had a sponsor, right? And the studies Absolutely. will say that women are over mentored and under sponsored. And, and so to be able to create that culture and assumption that our role, right, is about lifting other people. It's about opening doors and, and creating those pathways. And so a great, great, great examples and, and practices there. Brian, thank you so much. Thank you you're, very much. You, Brandon, you um, you're here and welcome. Um, we'd like thank to- uh, kick off the interviews with you. And I'm just going to check in with Robert if you'd like to uh, start the first question with Brandon. Yes, I would. Specifically, Brandon, so you have a really interesting business model. Talk about what that is, but then describe why you decided to become a B Corp. Yeah, thank you, Robert. And it's uh, really a pleasure to be here today. It's a, it's a great topic. It's an important topic. Um, Kehi is about a 70 year old company that started uh, way back in the day as a distributor of international and specialty products to grocers. Over the course of time, we've morphed quite a bit. The, the way people eat uh, has changed quite a bit and, and what grocers and natural food stores are looking for has changed. And so today our business model is pure wholesale. It's not a very sexy business. We're a brick and mortar you know, 16 warehouses, about 6,200 uh, associates across North America delivering specialty natural and organic and, and fresh products to grocers uh, or retail food companies of all types. Uh, we're an ESOP. So the company is literally owned by the employees, which is a unique part of our culture and something I'll probably talk a bit uh, more about as we move along. And then a few years ago, it became clear to us that our mission was, was a bit different than uh, just producing results for shareholders. And that's when we investigated the B Corp concept and became one of the largest B Corps uh, in America. B Corp is basically a force for good where in uh, your corporate bylaws, right through your board of directors, you uh, sign up that there are things that are more important or just as important as producing a return for your shareholders. The community that you operate in, the people that work for you, your stakeholders of all kinds, and including your suppliers, have to be treated in the same way and with as much respect and responsibility as, as just uh, getting a return. So B Corp is a big part and shapes who, what our culture is as well. Thank you, Brandon, I'll, I'll pick up from there. You, you know, you talked about culture here throughout the, the, the session today. Um, Brandon, tell us more about the culture uh, at Kehi and, and some of the core levers or val principles that you have around the culture that's helped you to really drive some of the things that they're, you're doing in the organization. Yeah, thanks, Becky. You know, every company is unique and, and Kay, he believes we're unique. One of the things that makes us unique is we've got a founding value. And since the company has been uh, in existence, we're what we call faith friendly. And what faith friendly does for us is it says, we ask all 6,200 of our employees to bring their whole person with them to work. And it, it seems a shame to us that you can know as an example that someone has a couple of kids and they both play soccer but you really don't have any other understanding of who they are and what they believe and, and, and if they've got a faith uh, system that's important to them, we wanna know about it. We think it makes uh, obviously them a whole person and it makes us a better company. So at the core of what we do is this faith friendly uh, part of our culture. What that leads to is um, a company that serves to make lives better. And that, that kind of infiltrates everything that we do. We serve our vendors, we serve our retailers, we serve our fellow employees, but most importantly, what we do and what it allows us to do is create a culture where people go out into the community and around the world and serve, uh, serve people that are less fortunate. What that does is bring them together. It gives them a, a purpose higher and bigger than what we do, just moving boxes. And, and again, it's a core part of our culture. You know, I want, to, I want to get back to something. I think that um, given the work that Shambaugh leadership does in the inclusion diversity area, bringing our full selves to work, that comes up about 99% of the time when we're doing organizational diagnostics and assessments. 
And that's always a blind spot or an area where companies, executives aren't aware that people don't feel comfortable showing up with their full self. Um, and there's no sort of secret sauce to that, right? So that's why I'd love to share, have you share more about how you've been able to create that culture. I know the words are one thing to bring our full self to work, but do you hold your leadership accountable? Is there storytelling in the organization that refers to that? Are people rewarded for that? Tell us more about how you make that a reality. Well, it, you know, the first thing I would say is it has to be absolutely inclusive. In other words, if it's one religion, if it's one belief system and everybody else is, is excluded or, sec or another way of saying it is if, it's, if it becomes something that you have to do or you're not included in leadership or, or otherwise, it, it, you know, it doesn't work. So the first thing I would say is for any company that's interested, you have to navigate and it has to start at the top and you have to have a belief, a true belief that everybody's whole person is important. And so inclusion for us just starts right there. Um, we want everyone to bring that whole person with them. We want everyone to serve. We want everyone to feel comfortable in all of those uh, places. And frankly, there's a lot there that is uncomfortable for people. And I think our culture at large has made that a very uncomfortable topic. In fact, we're told most of the time, don't bring it with you to work. It's what makes us different. And uh, I could give you a, a literally a million examples, but we change our people's lives by them going out uh, into the world around them in what they think is a service opportunity that's gonna help others. And they always come back as a better person and it makes them a better employee and, and a better mother and father and so forth. So. We just think it sort of all ties together. It's got to be sincere. It can't be exclusive. And frankly, it has to start at the top. Right. Walking the talk, right? People always look for the leadership, right? And what's what's their narrative? What's their commitment, right? I, I, I wonder too, with all the work you're doing in the community and a lot of the key values and beliefs and assumptions in your culture, have you noticed a difference? I mean, you've experienced significant growth, right? Over the last year, several years. Maybe you could talk about that, but how is inclusion, the, this sense of community um, really uh, impacted the business um, for you all? Yeah. yeah, the way that I started to talk about it when I came into the company is we have to look like America. And you know, 10, 11, 12 years ago, we didn't, right? We were male and we were white. Today, we have about 6,300 employees, so kind of a mid-sized company, more than 50%. In fact, it's almost exactly 60% of our workforce are minorities. If you take a look at what we would call our professional group, our three major corporate offices and our professionals that are out dealing face-to-face -face with our customers, that's about 900 people. 50% of them are females, and that is a major change from where we were you know, a number of years ago. Now, I, I bring that up because, um, you know, not to brag about it, because it's literally an imperative that we look like America. It's an imperative that we look and feel like the customers that we serve and the vendors that we serve, and ultimately the end consumer, which we all know is, you know, everybody, everybody eats and, and America is, is a tapestry of, of male and female and of color. And so I'm glad that our company is on the journey, and that's really what this is, is on the journey to becoming better uh, and more diverse. But I view it as imperative. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's an option. So I think it's, it's kind of getting back to the why for DNI, right? It's, it matters. It's, it's not just a nice thing to do. It matters for the business, obviously, and for people as well. I, I, I know that you said 50% of women are represented within the organization in certain demographics. Can you share one thing that, that has really helped to move the needle uh, that your organization has done to achieve that? You know, like so many companies, we've got some programs and, and those I think are what I had mentioned. First off, a number of years ago, we asked a group of our employees to create a, a, a civility code. And that helped us think about the way that we should treat each other. And that group of employees did a far better job than, than we could have done in leadership. Uh, so that's been really impactful. And as that rolls out and has rolled out and is up in all the warehouse and lobbies, and as we talk about it, as we live it, people really begin to understand 
that this is serious, right? How we treat each other with dignity and respect matters. You have to have courage to step out and call people out or maybe to, to be the person that calls somebody else out. Those are things that, that are in our, in our civility code. And then we've got a diversity and inclusion council, all volunteers, all employees from across the company of all different colors, male and female, and they are who help guide us in, in the things that we do in this area. And then we've got a couple of ERGs, uh, both a women empowered group and, and an African-American council, both of whom do a great job, both of whom I'm really proud of. They take it really seriously in both of those cases as ERGs to make Kehi a better place to work for that group of people. And so it's, it's all about, you know, what, what do we need to do as a company to be better and to be a better place for them to work? We wouldn't be as good without them. I'm really glad they exist. And at the same time, they're, they're, they're sort of doing all that within the confines of our culture mm -hmm. and trying to make sure that they do it in a way that honors, you know, what we believe and who we are. And therefore, it, it, it really kind of becomes a, this symbiotic in a way of, of treating our people. All right, and I, and I think I heard, but maybe you could help to put some color on this, the ERGs and the organization. Um, talk about their purpose. Do they feed into uh, the organizational sort of goals and objectives, or is that a piece of that? Um, are they more of a conduit for their region to really explore further where some of the opportunities to move talent pipeline? Just tell us a little more about that, because I think a lot of the companies on our in our session today have ERGs or, or something like that in the organization. So how have you been able to leverage that? Well, let me first start with uh, something that we've learned over the last few years, and that is you've got to have coordination with all of this. You know, you, it, it sounds good and then you turn it loose and everybody goes out and runs hard. And we had both a, a DNI council and these ERGs that were all with great agendas and full agendas and all running as fast as they could. And it becomes overwhelming for an organization to try to understand what all that is. And so one of the learnings that I've had is that you've got to put a steerco in place. And by that, I just mean it's sort of an advisory or, or an oversight body, and it's only for the purpose of coordination. It's to make sure that those groups all are doing things in unison with each other for the same purpose that we're trying to get to and, and so that we don't overwhelm from a sheer agenda standpoint the rest of the organization so that that's been a big learning but to your question the key thing that each one of those ERGs is doing is very specific missions to try to make this a better place for that group of people to work and and in doing so what are they doing to inform the rest of the organization about things that matter the isms that most of us can't see what are they doing to try to uh, in, enhance careers uh, how do they enhance development? How do they en enhance uh, training? All those kinds of things. So it's a very specific set of agendas and mission, but not led by management, led by them. So that, you know, it, it's very specific to, right. to them and their group of people. So what I'm hearing is they're very empowered. They understand the, where they fit in the organization, but that big picture and how they can be purposeful to really provide that value to their areas of location, but also to the bigger to the bigger organization. Um, exactly. I have a very, probably wrap up last question here. Very important question. Uh, we talk about empowering women and, and the, you, you know, how to create more equitable workforces, organizations, but women can't do it alone. And we know that. Yeah. Men are still around 88%, if not more, of corporate executives we're seeing because of the WC, like an organization that's creating that movement. We're starting to see that change and pivot, right? Um, but we need men to be, part of the conversation. We need men to be a part of the solution. And I think when we do, we'll even have more traction. And we've been talking about that for so long, right? Um, so tell us about, perhaps you have a story or an example you can share with all of us. Uh, we'd like to learn and, and hear from you on that, that topic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I do. Um, it's, it's one of the defining moments, frankly, in, in our culture and in this in, the, in all things that we're talking about here today. We started a, uh, the group of Women Empowered about six or seven years ago. We started it with a simple breakfast during one of our large gatherings. And, and at the time, it was the first time that all of our women leaders were gathered in one place for the purpose 
of making them better and developing them. Uh, we invited in the, the executives uh, that were men. And so I first off tell the story that imagine being one of those 12 men that came into a room of 100 women and for the first time in their life, they were a, you know, a real minority. It was intimidating to them and I knew it and we had to talk about it. We opened it up with that and our women embraced them and made them a part of that activity and made them feel comfortable. And I think that's an important part. You can never leave the other group behind. So it's important, whether it's minorities or females or whatever, it's important to bring the men or the white, white uh, constituents along. And we learned it that way. The most poignant story though took place many years later, probably about two years ago, we were in the throes of the Me Too movement. We were in our fifth or sixth breakfast. We had developed you know, quite a ways. We thought we had a lot of momentum as a company. We probably had about 300 women in the audience and maybe 20 men. We had our bankers that were females there. We have two companies that are subsidiaries, both their CEOs are women, they were there. So we really had an important group and we were, you know, we were feeling pretty good about it. It was a panel discussion um, and one of the women on, on the panel on stage uh, was one of our most senior women in the company and she had been through an experience very recently at Kehi where she was essentially discriminated against and uh, it brought a pall over the room. It, it brought a, a, you know, a sincerity to the issue. Uh, we discussed it, we opened it up. It became really kind of one of those breakthrough moments in terms of just discussing. And so the core message that I would say is never underestimate the experience that minorities or women are having in your organization. And you always have to understand, even though you think you've got something rolling and you think you've got a great culture their experiences may be very, very different. So you've got to continue to mine that and understand it. In this case, this lady had the, the courage to bring it up in that forum. It created a great dialogue. And the, the last thing I want to say, and this is back to men, when we opened up the microphone for Q&A, the first person that went to the microphone was a man. He admitted that he was in the room. And he said, I, I didn't have the courage to do anything about it. What a great moment. And it, it changed our culture. Forever. Right. That was definitely a moment that you're right, created a shift, I'm sure, in the room. Yep. And, um, you know, what I'm hearing is that we, we have to create a safe place for men to really speak up and be a part of the conversation. And, and, but I think it's also for women to really speak up, right, and have a voice. And when they, when they experience something that may not be necessarily um, ideal uh, in a situation, we need to have them speak up as well, right? To create this dialogue, uh, to bring it to a place where we need to then think about how we need to shift our norms of how we interact and work together, right? So it takes two, but that's a powerful story, I think, and uh, how courageous of that, that male executive speaking up like that. Um, he really made a difference for sure. Um, you, you know, COVID has been with us for some time, I guess, my last question would be, um, given where we have gone over the last 12 months, do you see COVID really making a difference as we come back to work and in terms of what we're talking about, inclusion and, and, and equity? Do you think there's gonna be, we're gonna come out of this differently and, and have a different sort of a mindset around inclusion and equity? You know, I, I certainly, you know, can only give you an opinion. I'm, I'm no expert in it, but my observation is, is that, um, we are gonna come back differently. We will work differently. I think that's gonna be here for a long time. Um, and I think one of the challenges that we have in that regard is that I don't think we're gonna be face-to-face -face quite as much as we used to be. I think people have found comfort in being home and we've learned that we can do things uh, virtually. We've learned we don't have to travel quite as much. And I, I can't predict that those are gonna be here forever, but I think they're gonna stick for a while. And the challenge in that is that when you're not face to face, you can't relate quite as much. And so I think the risk that we have is, is that we could get siloed again. And whether it's male, female, or whether it's minority and white, I mean, the issue is, is how do we continue to, to glue ourselves together and be open and communicate and be purpose, purposeful? And I guess that's really the bottom line, right? Is we're gonna have to continue to be even more intentional in these areas 
in a new work environment when we're not going to be face to face as much as we have been in the past. Thanks, Brandon. You know, two words out and I'll turn it over to Robert. I cut across these great conversations with all of you is be purposeful and be intentional um, to really create this movement and make it a reality. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Really enjoyed the conversation with you. Robert, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Becky. And I, I thought those were terrific insights and, and real leaders that we could all learn from. So here are some insights that I got quickly. From, from Che, the concept of a Venn diagram, how smart is that to integrate your business, everything together? That is a great model to make strategy with. And um, a quote that, that Brian said is strategy without empathy is a wasted idea. And I think that's something for sure we can, we can all learn from. And again, a model. And speaking of models, what Brandon had is, it's basically, it's a different structure. So there's a terrific story, but structurally it's a B Corp. It's a faith-based organization. And at the core of that is sincerity. So you could do structurally or content, you can figure out the way to be a great leader like these three. So I want to thank all of you. Becky, always fun working with you. And everyone, please note, on March 24th, that's going to be the next Women Business Collaborative CEO Roundtable. So please join that. And now I want to hand it back to our fearless leader, Edie. Thank you. Is everyone humble? by hearing these stories of really the most sensitive cultures of three CEOs we've heard from that are just changed leaders. We can really think about as they've changed their companies and they've changed leaders and they're all gender equity. So if we look at that with Box and the whole electronic commerce that's in the pink tag, but the equitable platform and 56.3% women and 70% women customers and tied is thank you to Boxed and to Banfield as Becky and Robert were saying is it's just your whole purpose driven culture and again women in your leadership and the fact that you said 80% of women are in veterinary school and therefore how you take it down to your leadership and five out of your eight top women are in the executive suite. And clearly when we look at Brandon and we look at clearly a total change culture as Robert said with a B, but as you're thinking about the 50% female in your top professional, as we said, but 60% minorities, you all are such chain leaders that is so much of a model for every corporation in America. So with Robert and with Becky and with Jose and all of us from WBC, we are grateful to share your models of purpose-driven companies like we've never heard before. Thank you very much.